I'm going to do just like a quick 15 minutes just intro to what we're doing today, and then from there we'll start working. So I'm John, and I'm the data scientist at MailChimp, which is the logo over there on the left. Do we have any MailChimp users here? Yay, I see a few. Cool. So at this point, I think we've got about, oh, 5 million users. Uh, we send about 400 million emails a day. So MailChimp is a, is a newsletter service where essentially you sign up and you create a newsletter you want to send to an email list and you can send it. So anywhere, we have a free plan, so like your fantasy football league may send emails through us all the way up to really large businesses also send through us. Um, so that's MailChimp. We generate a lot of data, so I get to do fun things with it, like build products. Uh, using that data, and I get to do data science. So I do things like send time optimization. If you're a retailer and you make money through your newsletter, you probably care about maximizing the engagement that people give to the newsletter, and so you care about when do I send. Uh, different people engage with their mailboxes at different times because they're just awake at different times, they're commuting at different times. How do I optimize when I send each person such that it's you know, in the appropriate place in their inbox at the appropriate time, because a lot of people's inboxes now feel more like a stream, especially the promotions tab, right? You want to make sure that you're not buried under 20 newsletters. So that would be an example of a data science product that I get to build. We have a couple more products. Mandrill, which is the t-shirt I'm wearing. This is a, um, a transactional email product. So transactional email would be things like receipts uh, that you would just want to send real quick, or password reset emails, just straight one-to-one -one correspondence between an application and a person. And so we have another product called Mandrill that sends about a billion transactional emails a month on top of the eight billion we send through MailChimp. Then we have a third product called Tiny Letter. Uh, if you're just a regular human being and you want to send an email to say a lot of people like your blog followers, it can be hard through Gmail or something like that. Gmail limits you to 200 people per email. So if you want something that's like Gmail except can send to more people, that's what Tiny Letter is. So we're an email company, but we do lots of different kinds of email things. So that's me. Now, I suspect a lot of y'all, oh, it, MailChimp is in Atlanta. So I'm from the South. You'll probably hear me use Southern words. Um, a lot of y'all are probably here because you're at a company that said something similar to, we should do big data. Usually, this is said by some sort of executive who went to a meeting and big data came up, or they read like a Harvard Business Review article and like, we should do big data because Harvard Business says it should. And then all of a sudden, you get a slide like this that's got the blue vortex. I talk a lot about this blue vortex where it's got numbers in it, and then there's like a bright light, and around that corner with the bright light is all of your money that you're going to earn when you do big data. Um, and this can be very confusing, right? So you go online and you try to find examples of big data in practice. So you might navigate to a site like this. This is a popular uh, restaurant and just business review site. And they released this product here that's a, a heat map. And sadly, they've curated the cities. So Atlanta's not even on here, sadly for me, but San Francisco is. And they've curated the keywords. So I can't even enter a keyword and I gotta pick one from the list. So here's hipster and San Francisco. And lo and behold, the mission lights up as on the heat map. So, wow, hipsters are in the mission. Um, so you look at this and you think, well, this really doesn't tell me anything I didn't already know. It's just sort of flexing their data muscle, right? Like I still don't really understand how this helps anything or how this is big data or what's going on. So here's another example you might find. This is from a popular social network, uh, professional social network and it allows you to take your profile, so this is mine, John, and just pull up connections, everyone I'm connected to, and see how they cluster, and it'll color the clusters different colors, and say, oh, these people are in this cluster, these people are in this cluster, and lo and behold, the clusters are just previous places I've worked. These are the people I met in grad school. These are the people in my previous job. These are the people at MailChimp. Um, I can highlight one big, oh yeah, I'm connected to that person, I already knew that. So now you're kind of wondering, I don't, I don't get it. It looks like they're just mirroring my data back to me, but it's pretty. So then you start looking at technologies. Maybe technologies will clear up what does it mean to do big data 
And that's when you get slides like this, which are horrifying. This is version one. This is version two. Uh, <laughs> so this is entirely unhelpful, right? And I find that a lot of companies end up doing this, where you choose your tools first. OK, we need to do big data. That's synonymous with Hadoop. I'm going to get Hadoop somewhere. Uh, I, I don't know what to do. I heard that we should be doing recommenders like Netflix and Amazon. So we're going to build a recommender for tires. I don't know. You know, a fraction of what's possible. And then you kind of flail about. And then there's this fourth step that often happens. You build an infographic to prove to your leadership that you did big data. So voila, done. I'd like to propose a more sensible way of going about things. First of all, know what's possible. I think this is what people should be learning up front. Um, know what's possible. In your company, get a sense of what data is available to you. Outside of your company, what data is available to you. Maybe it's for purchase. Maybe it's just available on the web, social data, scrapable data. Um, so what data could we possibly use to solve problems? Get an understanding of the technologies. You know, that's where most people start with big data. And then there's this other bullet point here, get to know the techniques. So get to know these things first, then identify a problem or an opportunity within your business that could benefit from data and data science, some transformation of the data into something useful that can bring insight to that problem. And then choose the data, the techniques, and the technologies that will solve that problem, right? So data science is not an academic thing. This word did not come out of academia. In fact, a lot of academics, when they hear the word data science, they kind of vomit a little bit in their mouth. It's, that the, it, it's a business thing, right? This was coined in the business world. It's about industry. It's about the problems that data plus some technologies and some algorithms can solve. And so that's what it should be used for. Find that problem in your business and then select the things that are going to solve it. So why are we here today? It's to learn a little bit about the techniques, right? And so I'm going to be doing tutorials from my book, which some people wrote and said, do I have to buy the book for this course? No, you don't have to buy the book. Don't, don't buy the book unless you want to. You know, wait until after the class today and then see, like, eh, that was three out of eight tutorials, do I want to own this book? And if you do, go buy it. Um, but I wrote this book essentially to break down techniques. And the reason I wrote it was because most of the data science books out there are, they use languages like R, Python, and those languages are awesome for doing production data science, right? For, for doing models at a normal business. But I think they're pretty crappy for learning. Because usually the way these data science books go is a couple pages about the input data. We're going to work on classifications of tulips. I don't know. So they, they lay out the data. Then you load up R. So here's our environment. And then they load in the data. And you look at the data inside of R, inside of Python. And so you, you print it out. OK, here it's in columns. And then they say something like, now we want to predict x. So we're going to load in the artificial intelligence package and predict. We're going to build a model and predict. And all of the stuff you should learn is hidden from you, right? Because you just load it in a package where some academic has done all the work for you, and you just build an AI model and go. This is really similar to back in the 90s when AOL was big. Um, I remember writing chatbots where you could like go into chat rooms and like spew ASCII art into the chat room and be like, John is cool, and it would like draw things. And I had no idea what I was really doing. All I knew is I loaded all this stuff into Visual Basic I needed to build my bot, and then I customized it a little bit. Um, but I never really understood all the things that were going into these chat bots. So I wrote a book that just does this stuff in spreadsheets so that if you're curious, uh, you can actually learn all the steps it takes to build a model not that you would ever want to, in real life, build all of your artificial intelligence models in Excel. Yes, you can do that, but it's kind of painful. But now you really know what's going into them. So you can feel confident when you build them in some other environment. Oh, yeah, I know exactly what it's doing, because 
I did it by hand. This is similar to in grad school, you might have to do something on paper. You would never do it on paper again, but you did it once. So, what are we doing here? I want to teach you all just a bit about differentiating between techniques. A lot of people think there's just kind of one technique in data science. It's just machine learning, and that's it. And it's all the same. And there's not. So I want to just go through some different techniques so you can distinguish between them and learn how to prototype, and, type, prototype in them. Why Excel already went through that. A couple of warnings. I've never done this before, ever. So I wrote the book, but the great thing about writing the book is I can take as much time as I want, and no one's looking over my shoulder. Never done it live. So I'm going to be like jamming formulas into the spreadsheets live. Hopefully you'll be following along. It could be painful. The good news is it ends around noon, regardless of what happens. So there's that. And secondly, we're actually going to do the real math, and there will be formulas. If you get lost, just know at some point a tutorial will end and we'll go to the next one. Also, feel free to sneak out. I won't hold it against you. Um, tomorrow at 2 o'clock, I'll be hanging out near the Wiley booth, which is in the big hall. So if you have further questions or want to come by, um, feel free to come by and we can work through stuff then. Wiley wanted me to be there for like a, a book signing, but I can't imagine anyone who would want me to sign this book. So I imagine I'm just going to be sitting there really sad with pens. So this would be a great time to like do office hours. So that's that. Uh, the agenda. We're going to do some supervised machine learning, and then some forecasting, and then some optimization. In the supervised machine learning, we're going to be doing naive Bayes. So there will be a bit, little bit of natural language processing, which just means like cleaning up language. And then in the forecasting section, there's going to be a bit of optimization and a bit of simulation. So you're going to have flavor for both of those. And then optimization is just going to be boring old optimization. And then for later, if you have questions, feel free to reach out on Twitter. Also, there's my email address. You can just reach out there. OK. Let's get started. Uh, for those who came in late, if you didn't download the spreadsheets, there are USB drives right here at this front table. Feel free to just walk on down and grab one and copy the, U the, the spreadsheets to your computer and work along. So plenty of spreadsheets to go around. You got time because I'm going to do a big introduction to probability first. So we won't be in a spreadsheet for about 10 minutes. OK. Naive Bayes. So I'm wearing this Mandrill t-shirt today. Mandrill, like I said, is our transactional email product, a MailChimp. And the funny thing about MailChimp is there are no other MailChimps in the world. So whenever there's a tweet online and someone says, I hate or I love MailChimp, we know it's about MailChimp, because why else would you be using the word MailChimp? But for Mandrill, a mandrill is just a mandrill, which is a real animal. So when people tweet about mandrill on Twitter, they tweet about a lot of different things, right? So I've grabbed three examples. Um, Mega Man X is a very popular Super Nintendo game that came out many moons ago. I loved it. Um, but there's a, a boss on that game called Spark Mandrill, which has a song people really like. It's like his theme music from this video game. And so you will see a lot of people talking about Spark Mandrill on Twitter. Um, there are also apparently a band called Mandrill, and so you'll see a lot of people talking about the band Mandrill. People also talk about, like, the zoo. Um, so we have all these tweets about Mandrill, and then sometimes we get tweets about Mandrill, the email service. And it could be like this one, hey, someone has integrated something with Mandrill's API. It could be that they're stuck on something. And so one of the questions that comes up is, how in the world do I weed out all of this noise and just filter mandrel tweets, right? And so that's usually done through text classification. Uh, you see this problem come up a lot in spam filtering, right? It's the same as spam filtering. How do I separate the spam from the ham? Uh, someone mentions Nigerian prints. Someone mentions Viagra. Those tokens probably mean they're talking about spam. So it's the same kind of thing. Other, other folks are now using this. You, know, a lot, you hear it a lot come up. These days, uh, sentiment analysis, people classify tweets that are like, oh, happy or sad, or you know, whatever two emotions they want to split on. Um, so that, that's a place where it comes up as well. And so naive Bayes, uh, and we'll go through what that is, is just one model that's sort of built for lots of features, i.e., lots of different words in a vocabulary, vocabulary, and looking at those words and saying, okay, 
based on the words in this document, I know this is spam, I know this is ham, I know this is about mandrel, I know this is about something else. Um, and it just takes, past, it's the way it works is it, it's a supervised AI model, so it's going to take past examples. These are past examples of tweets about our app. These are past examples of tweets about other stuff. And then it's going to use those examples to classify future observations. Okay, a new tweet's come in. Based on my past examples, this one looks like it's about the app. This one looks like it's about something else. That's all supervised AI means, is I've, I've taught it using past examples. Um, in order to use Naive Bayes, we've got to learn some probability. So we're going to have probability class right now. It's not going to take that long, but... Uh, if you get lost, don't worry. Once we hit the spreadsheet, it's going to feel more intuitive. Introduction to probability. I love these slides because I'm, I'm used to making like really pretty slides, but we get to play college this morning, so it's like the crappiest slides ever. This white background with some bullet points. Edward Tufte would hate this. Okay, so here are some, some probabilities. Michael Bay's next film will be terrible. The probability of that happening is 100%. Uh, the way that's usually written is just a 1. So usually probabilities are given between 0 and 1 as decimals and not actually in percents, but just to show you those are the same thing, 1 and 100%. Probability that I eat wings today when I travel and I'm away from home, for some reason buffalo wings show up a lot, I give it 50%. Conditional probability. This is something we need to know. Probability that I will ever go vegan is very low. Probability that I will ever go vegan conditioned on the fact that you pay me a billion dollars is 100%. I'm willing to never eat meat again if you'll pay me a lot of money. So how do these two things relate? If the probability is that low, how can it be one given that you pay me a billion dollars? So there's this thing called the law of total probability. It basically says I can relate this event, like me going vegan, to me going vegan based on a lot of different conditions so long as those conditions encompass everything, right? So here I've got two conditions, that you pay me a billion dollars and that everything else happens but no one pays me a billion dollars. So those could be two different conditions that sum up the whole possibility of events. One is just not the other one. And I can take them and I can take their probabilities and I can multiply them by the probabilities of the conditions happening. So this is kind of like weighting them. And I can sum it up. So. The probability of me going vegan, given that you pay me a million buck, a billion dollars, is one. It's one hundred percent. But the probability of you giving me a billion dollars is zero, because you don't have it and you wouldn't give it to me. So that's zero times one. On the flip side, the probability that you're not going to give me a billion dollars is one. I just I guarantee you, you will never give me a billion bucks. And the probability of me going vegan, given that you don't give me a million dollars, well, that's the original probability, pretty much. So I can multiply those out, sum them up, and I get my original probability. So that's how the law of total probability works. Joint probability. This just think of the word and. Probability of this and this happening. And the way that's done is via a comma. So probability that I'm going to eat Taco Bell this week, 20%. I usually eat it like one day a week. Probability that I'm going to listen to cheesy electronic music this week, like 80%. That's most of my playlist on Spotify. So what's the probability that I'm going to do both? John eats Taco Bell and John listens to cheesy electronic music. Well, we can use what's called the chain rule to calculate this joint probability. And the way that works is I can basically break apart the events. What's the probability I'm going to eat Taco Bell times the other event, but I've got to condition it on the first one. Because for them both to occur, I've got to kind of put this condition in. So probability that I'm going to eat Taco Bell times probability that I listen to cheesy electronic music given that I'm eating Taco Bell. Okay? So that's how the chain rule works. And the interesting thing here is that these events are independent. My eating Taco Bell has nothing to do with me listening to electronic music or vice versa. So I can actually break apart this whole thing. Um, what we see here is that John listens to cheesy electronic music given that John eats Taco Bell. Well, that's just the probability that I'm going to listen to cheesy music. The condition doesn't mean anything, right? So I can just simplify the whole thing, and voila, it's this and it just breaks apart into basically one probability times the other. So the 0.2 times 0.8 is 0.16. So all that's happened there is, 
I mean, this makes perfect sense, right? If I've got two probabilities and they both have to occur, the odds that they're both going to occur is going to be less than the odds that either one would occur. So that's joint probability. Any questions so far? No, no, just that they're both going to occur in the week, right. you know. Um, I, I guess I could listen while eating Taco Bell. Let's talk about something that's more of a dependent situation. So a dependency is when one event actually, you need the other event to occur, or if it, you know, they're somehow actually tied to each other. So probability that I listen to cheesy music, I said that's 80% this week. Probability that I listen to Depeche Mode this week, I'll put that at 30%. So what is the probability that I'm going to listen to cheesy music given that I listen to Depeche Mode? Well, Depeche Mode is cheesy music, right? So if I'm listening to Depeche Mode, if that's the condition, then of course I'm listening to cheesy music. So all of a sudden, that probability is 100%, right? Because these events are related. It's a tautology. So, the way that we can actually calculate um, <clears throat> this joint probability between the two, given that there's this dependency, is we can use this chain rule again, right? So I can break it apart and I can say, oh, the probability of one happening and the other happening, I'll pull out the Depeche Mode one and put it by itself, so probability of you listen to Depeche Mode, that's 0.3, and then probability of listening to cheese, given they listen to Depeche Mode, we just said that was one. So all of a sudden, because they're not independent, I just have 0.3 times 1 equals 0.3, right? So the probability that they both occur is the same as the probability that I just listened to Depeche Mode. All right, we're almost done with this introduction. Bayes rule. So we had to do all that to build up to this because the AI model is based on this. When we get into the spreadsheet, this is going to feel really natural. So if it seems frightening here, don't worry about it. All right, so now I've got three probabilities. I've got the probability I listen to cheesy music, that's 80%. Probability I listen to Depeche Mode, that's 30%. Probability that I listen to cheesy music, given that I'm listening to Depeche Mode, that's 100%. So I've got these three, but I'm missing this fourth one. Probability that I listen to Depeche Mode, given that I'm already listening to cheesy music of some kind, which could be Depeche Mode. So you would just intuitively think, sure, the probability that I'm listening to cheesy music is 0.8, and probably listening to Depeche Mode is 30%, but if I'm already listening to cheesy music, surely that raises that, the likelihood that it, from 0.3, somewhere above that, right? And so Bayes' rule essentially allows us to take the conditional probability we already have, which is 100%, and flip it around, right? So what do I really care about? I care about this, this other conditional probability than the one I have. So Bayes' rule kind of creates this equality. Probability of B times probability of A given B equals probability of A times probability of B given A. It's kind of like flipping fractions over in algebra. So we can actually bring some of this across and get probability of A given B equals probability of A times probability of B given A divided by probability of B. In our context, that's the one we care about is probability of Depeche Mode given I'm listening to cheesy music. That's what I want to calculate. I can flip everything around by just multiplying by A, probability of Depeche Mode, times the condition I already know, which is probably I'm listening to cheesy music given the probability I'm listening to Besh mode. That's one. We already saw that. And then divide through by the probability of cheese, right? Probably I'm listening to cheesy music. And so doing the math, that's 0.3 times 1 divided by 0 0.8, 0 0.375. So all I did there is I took this original probability and bumped it up a little bit. And Bayes' rule tells us how to do that. Okay. So how are we going to use that to create an artificial intelligence model. And this is where we get into the spreadsheet. What do I have? I have past examples of mandrel tweets and past examples of tweets that are not about my app, right? So I want to compare, given a tweet, which I'm going to call word one, word two, word three. So I'm just going to, I'm going to treat my tweet as what's called a bag of words. So I've got these words that are just in this tweet. So given those words, all those words, which I can look at individually, What's the probability that it's about the app? And given those words, what's the probability that it's about something else? This is, these are the probabilities you want to compare as an AI model in order to make a prediction. Well, we can use Bayes' rule, right? So we can flip it around, and we can actually look at, okay, this original thing here, probability of the app, given the words, 
is the probability of a tweet just being about our app, just globally on Twitter, times the probability of all those words, given that it's an app tweet, so that's flipped, divided by the probability of just all those words occurring on Twitter in one tweet. Similarly, we can do that for a tweet about something other than the app. So you'll notice once we flip it around, the denominators are the same. Probability of these words appearing on Twitter. The denominators are the same, so let's drop it out. It's gone. And then here's where the naive part comes in. I can just assume all of my words are independent. Now, this is not true, right? If I say the word abject, the next word you generally think of is poverty, right? Those words tend to be paired together. If you go to Google and type in abject, that's kind of like the first thing that comes up. If I say the word full-blown, you tend to think of AIDS. That phrase tends to be paired together a lot. I don't know why, that's just the way people use it. So we know words are related to each other. They're not independent. Words appear together. But the naive part is to say that doesn't happen. All words are independent. Words can come in any order. They have no relation to other words. That's the naive base part, the naive part of naive base. So we're just going to take this thing we had, probability of the app times the probability of all of our words, given that the tweet's about the app, and we're just going to break apart that joint probability between all the words and just say, what's the probability of, of getting word one, given that the tweet's about the app? What's the probability of getting word one, given that the tweet's about something else, right? So now we're looking at individual words and calculating their probabilities and then just multiplying them. Another thing that's often done in this type of classification model is you just assume that the high level class probabilities, i.e. the probability that a tweet's about the app, probability that a tweet's about other, in a global sense, just assume they're equal. You'll see this a lot in spam filtering. Let's just assume that they're the same and drop them out. And so we're just left with this thing. We just need to compare the probability that this word would appear, given that I have a tweet about mandrel. What's the probability that the word spark would appear, given that this is a tweet about mandrel the app? What's the, what's the probability that this word appear, would appear given that it's a tweet about something that's not the app, like a video game? And just look at all the words in the tweet, multiply those probabilities together, and just compare these two products. And that can make a prediction. So that is how we build our AI model. So how do we calculate this probability? Let's, let's take the word Spark, since it was the name of that boss, Spark Mandrill in Mega Man X. How do we calculate that probability? Well, the probability of Spark given that the tweet is about the app, it's just we look at our, our historical data. We've got some historical tweets about the app, right? And we just say, I've got all these words. How many words do I have to sum them up? I've got a couple thousand words in my whoop, training set. So I've got all these words. How many of those words were Spark, right? Maybe it's one. So now one out of 2,000 would be the probability. And that's it. Okay, some housekeeping. Rare words. When I come to make a prediction, if I've never seen the word before, its probability will be zero in my historical data. That will zero out this product, because they're all multiplied together. And then the model just kind of dies. So I'm going to give them a one. I'm going to say, yeah, sure, I've seen it once in the past, which is a lie. But that's not fair to the words I've actually seen once. I'm going to give them an extra one, too. If I've seen it once, I'm going to give them two. Well, that's not fair to the words I've seen twice. I'm going to give them a one and they're three. So I'm going to add one to everything, right? So rare words I've never seen before, they get a one. You'll see this a lot on Twitter because, um, like URLs, uh, a Bayesian model will not have seen some new URL before. So you might as well just drop it or just give it one and be like, yeah, sure, I saw it once. And you get, you get that on either side. Um, that's called additive smoothing. We just add one to every count. Another problem is called floating point underflow. When you multiply lots of tiny probabilities together, the computer dies because you get a number that's really small. In order to handle that, we just take the products and we just put a natural log around it. That turns, in, in the way natural logs work, is we put a natural log around it, we can actually then break it apart and we sum them. So log of this probability plus log of this probability. Those are going to be directionally equivalent to the original comparison. And so instead of getting like a tiny, tiny number, we're going to get a solid negative looking number. And you'll see that come into play. So this, none of this will be a surprise. Okay. 
That's the hardest part of today. So that, that was literally the, the hardest thing we're going to do today. We just did it. So at this point, I'm going to go to the spreadsheet. This is last call for the USB drives. If you need to, a copy of the spreadsheet, they're all right here in this pile of USB drives on the front table. Feel free to come up and grab one. Um, some people are also holding them up. If you've done, feel free to, if you're done with it, feel free to drop it off here. I'm going to get started in a spreadsheet, and we're going to do some natural language processing. We're actually going to build one of these models, and you'll see how just not frightening it is. Okay, let's get started. If you have questions during this, just interrupt me, okay, and just say, I, I really don't understand what you're doing. So, Yes, so we're going to start in this spreadsheet called Mandrill, if you downloaded it off of the internet. It's called Mandrill underscore clean, if you grabbed it off the USB drive. And it's from chapter three of the book. Um, now, in this spreadsheet that I put on the USB drive, it's called clean because I've deleted a bunch of stuff out of it. So, what have I kept? I've kept three tabs. I've got my training data about Mandrill app, and it's just a bunch of tweets from the past about Mandrill. I've got another tab called About Other, and it's going to be the same, just a bunch of tweets about other. Now, in the, in the ones off of the website, you're going to have some formulas here. Feel free to delete those. I'm actually about to put them in. So this is just a clean slate where all you have are your tweets. I also have this tab called Test Tweets. Similarly, it's, it's got some formulas to clean up the tweets in columns B through about H. Feel free to delete those formulas out there as well. Uh, the test tweets tab is what we're going to use to test this AI model after we've built it. Okay? So, one of the fun parts of natural language processing is cleaning up and splitting apart your data. We have all these tweets, but there are some problems. Number one, we care about individual words and how frequently they occur. So at some point, we're going to be breaking apart our training data and summing up the occurrence of individual words, right? That's where we want to get to. Now, with regular, most of these are in English. Some of them appear to be in French. I see one down there. Pod de list management, par exemple, whatever. Um, people tend to do things like capitalize words. Here's Capital la, raison, the reason, I guess. Um, is that the same thing as lowercase la? In most circumstances, it is. So we're going to lowercase things. Furthermore, people like to put punctuation in language, like this comma here. So all of a sudden now, rather than we, we've got we with a comma. And the computer's going to want to treat that as a word. So we want to strip out punctuation. However, we want to do it in a way that doesn't mangle URLs. URLs have punctuation in them too, don't they? But we'd like to keep them as a whole word rather than saying like HTTP is a word and then stripping out the colon slash slash. So we'll get to that in a second. So we want to basically lowercase everything, get rid of punctuation, and then split on spaces. Right? So we're going to turn punctuation just into spaces. Um, and so it's just going to look like word, space, word, space, word, space, or maybe there'll be like space, 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 word. And then we can take out all of the spaces and just split up the words and then start summing them up. And that will be sort of the cleaned version of our text. So, first things first. Yeah, just clean them out. Clean them out. Um, yeah, just delete columns B through H. And feel free to delete any sheets that are not these three sheets. Um, so that you've got sort of like a fresh sheet to work with. Basically, if you've, if you've downloaded the sheet off of the website, everything has been done for you. You're done. <laughs> so you can just delete where we're, to where we're at and then follow along. So yeah, just clear out columns B through H. The so first thing I'm going to do, and rather than give you a big intro to Excel, I'm going to assume you guys kind of know Excel, and if I do anything that's completely crazy, like, what in the world did you just do? Just stop me and I'll tell you. I just did X. So the first thing I'm going to do is just lowercase everything, right? That's the lower formula. So in column B, I just pointed at column A and I said lowercase it. In Excel, 
You can copy this down by just double clicking the lower right corner. So, boom, now everything's lowercase, right? So, you can just double click the lower right corner to do that. Um, other things you can do in Excel, you can jump around by holding down Command on Apple or Control on Windows and in a column just jump around. So, rather than copy it down like that, I could have you know, copied the cell and then jumped to the bottom and then highlighted everything and then pasted. And that would have done the same thing. Okay, so I just lowered everything. So now I want to get rid of punctuation, right? Let's start with periods. I can use the substitute, and I'm going to make a lot of misspellings here, so cut me some slack. I'm going to take this, this column B, which is now lowered, and I'm going to substitute out the periods for spaces. So I'm going to point it at column B, substitute um, in column B, yeah, old text. I can't just do a period because then you, know, you get .com, things like that, .co. So instead I'm going to do period space because I don't want to mangle my links. But this will strip out most periods that are not part of the URL. So old text, period, space. New text, just a space. I'm going to substitute out period space for just a space. Just get rid of periods, except those I care about. So now you can see in this resulting one, no periods until we get out to this bit.ly link, and you'll see the period's still there. I'm going to take this bottom right corner, double click it, send it down. Done. Uh, let's do commas. Substitute. There's my text. Old text. Commas don't appear in URLs usually, so I'm just going to replace a comma straight up with a space. Done. Double click it, send it down. What else? Uh, let's try question marks. They're a form of punctuation, right? New text, space, done. Send it down. How about exclamation points? Substitute. And you'll notice I just keep referring back to the previous one I just cleaned. So clean it again with the new thing, right? So exclamation point, space. Send it down. Uh, let's take out colons. Hmm? I'm probably doing them in a different order than in the book because I forget what order I did them in. Column D was comma. I did period, space. I did comma so far. I've done question mark. I've done exclamation point. Yeah, let's take out some colons. Why not? Clean them out. I'm going to put a. I'm sorry. Just across the top, could you just put what thing you're taking out each one so you don't have to Yeah, sure. I could just point to it. Yeah, that would be, that would be easier. So this one I'll do colon and then a space because colons appear in URL. So put a space after to only get rid of the other colons. So here, colon, what's this one? Exclamation point, question mark, comma, what a novel idea, period, lowercase. Last one, just for completeness, let's do semicolons. I swear, this is the, the last amount of punctuation I can think to put in, so. Semicolons don't really need a space after them because they're not really present in most URLs. Place it with the space. Boom. Semicolon. So now we.